Today, 29th September, we're coming close to the fourth month of Ukraine's offensive. Yesterday, there were lots of reports of another attempt by Ukraine to break through in the Rabotino Verbovoye area. There were claims that Ukraine had now switched its emphasis, that it was now trying to attack to the west of Arabotino towards a village called Kopani and trying to outflank the Russians in that kind of way. There were reports of more Ukrainian attacks towards Verbovoye and uh, there was one report which suggested that as many as 15 armoured vehicles were involved in the attack towards Kopani, most of which allegedly were tanks. And then, of course, the hours passed and there were fewer and fewer reports about what had been happening with this particular attack. And anyway, the short answer is that the outcome was the same as always. The Ukrainians were unable to break through. The attack ended in a failure. There were more Ukrainians, more Ukrainian losses, uh, more Ukrainian troops eventually um, forced back to their initial starting points and yet another Ukrainian attack in this area has ended without any success being achieved. And there were also further reports of heavy fighting in the Bakhmut area. The Ukrainians were said to be trying to recapture the village of Orekhov, Orekhovo Vasilyevka, which Another Russian report, a, pre, a, a, a Russian report once again reiterated, has now come under Russian control. Anyway, the Ukrainians were supposed to be counterattacking there. They were supposed to have made further attacks um, um, in the Klosheyevka area. But again, the reports that have come through essentially tell the same story. Ukrainian attacks against heavily fortified Russian positions which have achieved nothing. More Ukrainian soldiers killed, more equipment lost and destroyed, but once more, no breakthrough. And the Russians, Russian lines remain intact. And this, of course, as I said, as we are now approaching the fourth month, the end of the fourth month, of Ukraine's counteroffensive. And there's been a somewhat bitter article about all of this in the New York Times, one with a map. It shows the minimal extent of Ukraine's advances over the course of this year. It points out that the amount of territory Ukraine has captured overall this year is significantly less than the amount of territory that Russia has captured course the bulk of the territory that Russia has captured over the course of this year was in the early months of this year when the Russians launched their offensive spearheaded by the Wagner group towards Bakhmut which eventually ended in the capture of that town but anyway the Russians have captured more ground in Ukraine than the Ukrainians have done despite their counteroffensive, the Ukrainians having launched their counteroffensive, and perhaps significantly and intriguingly, over the course of August, the Russians actually captured more ground in Ukraine than Ukraine itself did. This, of course, being the product of the Russian offensive towards Kup Kupiansk and towards the Oskol river line. And, of course, it's not equivalent to talk about territory captured because the Russians this year have not been aiming to capture territory. Now, this has become absolutely clear as crystal, but last October, October last year, the General Surovikin, who was, for a time, the overall Russian commander in the theatre, he actually explained the Russian strategy very clearly. He said it was to create major fortified lines, 
to build up a strategic reserve and to grind the Ukrainians down, grind the Ukrainians down on the defence lines. And that was the Russian objective. And the fact is that this New York Times version of events, this New York Times account, has effectively confirmed this, that the Russians had this plan and that they have been successful in its execution. And there's been a very strange um, comment. There was a very interesting comment, perhaps, um, in the by the Institute of, for the Study of War, which has been reproduced by all sorts of people, which is that uh, Putin ordered has ordered the Russian troops along the front lines to hold their positions in order to uh, and you know to defend their positions and that he's done this in order to create the illusion that the Ukrainian counteroffensive has been a failure which I have to say is logic which I don't understand, and it's been much derided across the internet, rightly so, justly so, in my opinion. But putting those instances of essential comedy to one side, the New York Times basically confirms the overwhelming success this year of the Russian strategy. Ukraine has been launching attacks since June. It's been trying to uh, break through these Russian defences. It has completely failed. It has suffered massive losses in the process. Even Western commentators now acknowledge this. And there was a very interesting comment buried inside this New York Times article from um, an expert, one of the experts that the New York Times consulted, and this expert said that the Russians seem to be comfortable with this situation. They seem to be comfortable with a situation where they've created these fortified lines, which Ukraine cannot break through, and it's not clear that the Russians have any plan at the moment to launch an offensive, because... The Ukrainians, in effect, are doing their work for them by uh, attacking these fortified lines and getting shattered in the process. So I think this is only partially true. I think there will be a Russian offensive eventually. We will come to that shortly. But one can see, finally, the, the penny starting to drop people beginning to understand that this has been a major failure for Ukraine. Nobody is stating it clearly that the offensive has been a colossal strategic defeat. But that, it seems to me, is the reality. And it is the reality that some people are now starting to acknowledge. Now, I have to say that there's been some very interesting discussion about tactics and strategy, which is not something I'm particularly strong on, not having a military background, but there was a very interesting piece about the situation in the Rabotino Verbovoye um, area of the battlefield specifically. And the essence of the point that was being made, and this was set out, by the way, in Slavyangrad, they provide very insightful analysis, as well as very accurate reporting about the war. Anyway, the point that was made there was that this area between Verbovoye and Rabotino, this area south of Orechov, where the Ukrainians have managed to create their salient, what they have actually done is that they have let themselves be lured by the Russians into what is essentially a fire trap. The, this, the area of the salient, which is in the low ground, 
essentially has already been prepared, pre-prepared by the Russians for this purpose. The Russians have accurately um, worked out the ground. They probably, to some extent, adapted the ground to this purpose. They will have laid minefields in various parts of this area. And anyway, the long and the short of it is, by advancing into this salient in the way that they have, the Ukrainians have actually played into Russian hands because they've essentially assisted the Russians with the attrition that the Russians want to conduct against the Ukrainian forces. And it was a very insightful article. It said peace. It also made some various other points about how there's, in some respects, too many Ukrainian units involved in this fighting, in this very dense, small area, that that's depriving the Ukrainians of flexibility and room for manoeuvre, that the various units are not well coordinated with each other because they haven't trained to conduct operations together, that Orechov, which is the main logistical hub in this area, is um, perhaps over-congested, and that on top of that, as the rain and the mud comes, um, the Ukrainian forces trying to push south in this area are going to be increasingly restricted to the metal roads, the paved roads, rather than be able to advance across the fields. And that this um, is going to restrict movement even further. And of course, by extension, um, create more and easier targets for the Russian artillery and the Russian anti-tank systems and the Russian helicopter gunships if they can operate in rainy weather, which I presume to a certain extent they can. Anyway, that this is going to actually work very much to the advantage of the Russians. Now, I noticed that in an interview with, I believe, The Nation, um, General Kirill Budanov, the head of Ukraine's intelligence, uh, military intelligence, he said that the, this autumn the Ukrainian offensive will be conducted almost entirely on foot because uh, wheeled vehicles will not be able to operate in the damp, wet conditions, the soft ground, and tracked vehicles, by the way, would also have problems. He didn't talk about those so much. But there's no reason to worry because the offensive can nonetheless still continue because the infantry can still march over the soft ground on foot through the mud. Well, all I can say is that General Budanov clearly is not a walker, which, by the way, to a certain extent I am. It is one of my favourite recreations. I like to go um, walking, um, sometimes in good weather, occasionally in bad. Um, and I can say that the idea of expecting large numbers of men, even dispersed men, the idea that they can walk across boggy or even wet fields in the rain in autumn and um, still be able to advance steadily. <laughs> um, some of these fields, of course, being also mined and that this isn't going to restrict their movement. Well, it is a fantastic idea. It is, it is an absurd one, especially given that these men will be presumably carrying their weapons and other packs, and they'll be in body armour and all of those things. And, of course, the one thing that would be particularly difficult to do is that, of course, apparently in some of the attacks that have been taking place, as the Ukrainians have been trying to storm Russian positions on foot um, in the late summer, early part of September. They were apparently doing it on the run. Well, if you want to try and do that as a group across 
a soft, wet field in the rain, well, all I could say is it's not a good idea and better not try it. This is, if this plan is executed, if the Ukrainian troops really are going to try trudging across the mud towards the Russian positions, mud, of course, being slippery as well in places, well, all I can say is um, the casualty rates are simply going to skyrocket to absolutely appalling proportions. And the effect on the men who are asked to trudge across the fields in that way, I mean, it, 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 it is unimaginable. It is unfathomable to me that a military commander would want to put his soldiers through such a thing. But anyway, that's what General Budanov says, whether what's left of the Ukrainian high command, uh, Zaluzhny, Tarnavsky, Sirsky, all of those actually execute on this ex bizarre strategy. Um, I, of course, don't know. But anyway, that's what I would say about that. That's about the one piece of knowledge, direct knowledge, that I do have about um, about these sort of things that might um, help and add to the overall situation, that, that might help in understanding the overall situation. I noticed, by the way, that uh, Julian Repke, who is a uh, German journalist who writes for Bild, Bild Zeitung, and who's been a a very active commentator about the war on behalf of Bill Seitink. He is fervently supportive of Ukraine, but he does sometimes write some insightful pieces. He's issued a fairly interesting email thread, Twitter thread, um, which um, appears to be based on information he's been given from Polish sources, the, Pol the Poles apparently have told him that Ukraine is now suffering severe manpower issues. The best trained and most experienced soldiers have been lost. There are major problems with the equipment. The equipment is from too many countries. It's very difficult for Ukraine to keep all of this equipment operating effectively. But most importantly, Röpke admitted to a point which I have made many, many times, which is that even as Ukraine's army grows weaker, Russia's army is growing stronger. Now, he continues to insist that Ukraine still has a chance of victory. I don't really see how he can see that. I don't see what the pathway of Ukraine towards victory is barring some completely unexpected crisis in Moscow. But anyway, let's put that aside. Let's focus instead on his admission that the Russians are getting stronger. He says they've learned from their past mistakes. They're far better organized. Their use of drones is becoming more effective all the time. And what he doesn't acknowledge is that the Russian army isn't just getting better, it's also getting much bigger. And bigger on an enormous scale, um, which of course is barely touched upon or discussed in the West. Anyway, in the meantime, even as the Russians apparently are improving, getting stronger, even as Ukraine is facing all these enormous problems, we've had another perhaps more august commentator, Admiral Radikin of Britain. He's now given a really quite bizarre interview with War on the Rocks. Now, Brian Boletic is going to do a programme about this interview, and I'm not going to therefore try and pass it myself. I, I'm not as skilled at unravelling some of the bizarre comments that Radikin has made. At least they seemed pretty bizarre to me. 
Well, I will mention a few things. First of all, he acknowledges many, a great many of the problems. He is talking about many of the problems that confront Ukraine, though he doesn't seem to be prepared to um, draw any conclusions from this. He talks about how um, Ukraine's army is principally a conscript army, um, training is not what it might be, there's an extraordinary agglomeration of weapon systems drawn from all kinds of different sources. Even I, way back last year, was saying that what was being created was a, with this smorgasbord of weapon systems coming from every conceivable country in the West, British tanks, German tanks, American tanks, um, British, French wheeled vehicles, Swedish tracked vehicles, German tracked vehicles, all of this was going to create a logistical nightmare, a Frankenstein army, in fact. And Brian Belletic, I don't remember, also said much the same thing. Well, Admiral Radikin has just sort of, sort of just dawned upon him that this might be a problem. He also admits that the Russian defence lines are rather denser and better than um, people had been led to believe. I find that equally bizarre, by the way. Again, <laughs> I read lots of commentaries and articles and things about how strong the Russian defence lines were. But anyway, Admiral Radikin says that the depth and complexity and sophistication and strength of these defence lines had been underestimated and this has been a factor in slowing the offensive, though he does still insist that progress is being made. Where he sees this progress, I can't see. And of course, the New York Times has cast cold water <laughs> on all of this. But anyway, that's some of the things that Radikin says. The part of it that really astonished me, that had me, had my, had me, my jaw dropping, was he said, you know, that of course, armies, weapons can do so much, but ultimately, what matters in war is economics. It's the economies, the strength of the economies that make war sustainable. And he talked again about a long war. But what exactly is he proposing? Is he proposing some kind of gigantic economic mobilization in the West to match or surpass Russian military production, which is still on the point, still on a steeply rising curve? It's going to grow substantially next year over the already high levels of this year? Is that what he's proposing? Or is he perhaps ignorant of the realities about what's actually happening in Russia? That the economy is now growing rapidly, that um, the overall economic situation in Russia is stable, despite higher inflation, that output is rising, that the economy is um, rapidly um, reaching the point where it will surpass the level that it had uh, reached immediately prior to the start of the, of the sanctions war last year and might even already have surpassed that point. Um, is, he, is he aware of any of this? Or is it something that he's ignorant of or perhaps he simply discounts it? Perhaps it's something that he can't acknowledge and admit to himself, even though there's been an article, to, there was an article yesterday in the Daily Telegraph that admitted that Russia's economy is growing, even though it attributes that fact entirely to the rise in oil prices. Anyway, um, I'm not quite sure what Admiral Radikin's intentions are, but the fact is, coming back to what Julian Röpke was saying, the Russians are getting bigger 
and stronger. Ukraine is getting weaker. A long war, as everybody in the West, all the American officials, were warning Ukraine way back before the offensive began. A long war works in Russia's interests. And that article in the New York Times that I was talking about, the one with the map, essentially says the same thing, that for the Russians, the year that has just been passed is a year which they, where they have been conducting attrition against the Ukrainian military. They've been um, basically killing Ukrainian soldiers, creating the manpower crisis that Röpke is talking about, um, causing many Ukrainian soldiers to become wounded, wearing the Ukrainians down, grinding them down. They, they did that in Bakhmut, with that horribly named Bakhmut meat grinder, and they've done that on an even bigger, in fact, much bigger scale, with the offensive as well. And the result has been catas catastrophe for Ukraine, a significantly weakened army, even as Russia's army grows bigger and stronger and its economy remains strong. So, again, I can't understand where Arad Admiral Radikin sees a path to victory for Ukraine, short of, as I said, some kind of gigantic mobilisation by the West, for which, may I say straight away, Western electorates have no appetite. Um, I don't see where he sees the path of victory. I don't understand how he can be thinking the way he is and why he isn't instead joining all those calls for negotiations. But anyway, there we are. I'm going to leave it to Brian Balletic to analyse this really very strange interview in more detail. Um, he's, as I said, somebody who can deal with the military realities perhaps better than I can do. Now, let's look then at what is coming. Um, if General Budanov has his way and Ukraine tries to continue its offensive through the autumn, as I said, um, all that will happen is that Ukrainian losses, which have, according to the Russians, somewhat declined, over the last week are going to be are going to start spiking again because advancing on foot across wet fields is not a good idea and of course if you try to do that in the rain and the mist and the fog and remember you know you get lots of fog and mist anybody who's a walker knows all about that in the autumn, especially if you're, if you're advancing along across wet fields. Well, um, anybody, any, if this is what the Ukrainians are going to do, well, it's not going to turn out well for them. We're going to see many more losses over the next few weeks. A further weakening of Ukraine. In other words, of course, the other option is for Ukraine to go on the defensive. This is the option discussed by The Economist, floated by Victoria Nuland. It's a advice given way back in August by Beeb and Webb in their article, which appeared in Time magazine. That's what Ukraine ought to do, perhaps, but it's not what Admiral Radikin and General Budana for talking about. But let's assume that the Ukrainians do try and go on the defensive. The question is where and to what purpose? If the Economist and Victoria Nuland and people like that, um, their line is followed, they'll try and remain on the defensive and continue the war through long-range missile strikes,
The number of missiles is finite. Julian Röpke sort of admits that the Russians are getting the edge in the drone war. The Russians are able to launch drone attacks and missile strikes on every single place in Ukraine. That doesn't seem to me to be a war-winning strategy. It's one that is going to cause even more destruction and death and misery in Ukraine. And besides, at some point, the Russians will undoubtedly launch their offensive, and they will do so with far greater power and force than Ukraine has, and with the Ukrainian army depleted and run down and demoralized, even if Ukraine finds the time and the means to set up fortifications, which is problematic, it might find it difficult to withstand that offensive when it eventually comes. Um, the best advice would be to follow the second part of what Beeb and Webb says, which is to seek negotiations. But that, of course, is an option which Budanov, Radikin, um, Newland, the Economist, President Zelensky, are all rejecting. They say that the only acceptable basis for peace continues to be Zelensky's peace plan, which Lavrov has rejected. And, of course, the Russians, for their part, have also made it clear that a ceasefire for them is not something that they're prepared to discuss or countenance at all. I discussed that at length in my programme yesterday. So, a defensive strategy, but a defensive strategy that is still distorted by illusions, by a refusal to seek that negotiation with the Russians on meaningful matters, to seek or agree a peace with the Russians quickly, which would be presumably the only way of rescuing Ukraine, the kind of thing that Jeff Roberts is talking about, that no one in the West or Ukraine seems to be talking about. So what is going to happen? Well, as I said, there's a major, massive Russian build-up underway. At some point, despite all the brave words, it seems to me that the illusion that Ukraine is continuing an offensive will have to be abandoned. Um, even if Ukraine doesn't formally go onto the defensive, that will be the reality. Russian forces in Ukraine today are undoubtedly very much stronger than they were at the start of this year. And that, I think, is an important point to stress. The hundreds of thousands of reservists who were called up last year, they're now fully trained. Many of them are now experienced, and they're much better soldiers than they were then. And the 400,000 troops that the Russians have called up or are in the process of calling up this year, some of them, those who were called up at the start of this year. Presumably, they're also by now trained and ready. And, of course, Russia has also benefited from a very big increase in its military production, which took place last year, and much more so this year as well. So, the Russians are stronger. And... I think that there's a good chance that at some point over the next few weeks or months, as people like Belitsky and Alaudinov and others have sort of hinted, there's a chance that they will launch counterattacks, local attacks in various places. And there's a very intriguing suggestion that's been floated, especially by Dima on the Military Summary Channel, but I've seen it taken up by others as well, 
And in fact, somebody who has been emailing me, who has been one of my most interesting and, in, in, um, and informed correspondents, and who has a military background, has been talking about this for a long, long time, many weeks. He says that there's a misunderstanding about the Russian tactics on the Oskol River, Kupiansk sector, that once again the Russians have been luring the Ukrainians into an undefendable position, that Russian attacks on the bridges over the Oskol River, which have indeed been taking place, will me mean that Ukrainian troops east of the Oskol River now have very attenuated supply lines. I would add that though the Oskol River is a relatively small river and it can be waded across in some places, that last is probably only true in the summer. In the autumn, as the rains come, presumably the Oskol River will become more of an obstacle. And what's being suggested is that a not insignificant cauldron might be in the process of being of forming here, that the Russians might be working towards creating a cauldron. And of course, they could be doing the same thing. They might eventually do the same thing in the Rabotino Verbovoye sector. I've already said how this salient that the Ukrainians have carved out, which is probably a fire sack, but into which lots of Ukrainian troops have been funneled, um, looks like a potential cauldron as well. Now, at this point, I think I'm going to make a further observation about the overall Russian troop dispositions, because, of course, there's been this long standing claim both in Ukraine by Budanov, picked up by the British, to some extent accepted by the United States, that all Russian forces have been deployed on the front lines, that there are no real reserves behind the first line of defence. I've said that this is manifestly wrong. And in fact, if you actually follow You've actually been tracking, as closely as I have done, the fighting that's been taking place over the course of this summer and early autumn as the offensive has taken place. A number of interesting facts start to emerge. Firstly, nearly all the fighting, in fact, to a great extent, all of the fighting, has taken place in the zone of destruction beyond, in ahead of, the um, fortified lines, the Surovikin line. The Ukrainians have never breached that fortified, those fortified lines. They've only reached it in one place, which is um, in the area near Verbovoye, the village of Verbovoye. Contrary to repeated claims, they've not captured Verbovoye. I understand that even the Institute for the Study of War now sort of admits that Verbovoye is fully under Russian control. All the fighting, in other words, has taken place elsewhere, um, some distance from the major fortified lines in this control zone, which perhaps is more accurately described as a zone of destruction. And the Russian forces, which by some calculations outnumber the Ukrainians, an up person, a commentator on in the New York Times article says that they outnumber the Ukrainians three to one, which may be true, but not perhaps with the numbers of troops actually present in Ukraine. But anyway, the bulk of the Russian forces, the regular infantry, the tank forces, they've not been engaged so far in the war to any particular, to any great degree. That's not to say that they haven't been engaged at all, 
but most of the heavy formations, the tank formations, the motorized and mechanized infantry, they've remained in position principally behind the Surovikin line. If you're talking about the people who have been fighting the Ukrainians in the zone of destruction, they have been an interesting assortment of elite units, paratroopers from the airborne forces, which have increased significantly in size over the course of the uh, last year. The, a lot of the reservists who were called up last year were ex-paratroopers, and they've been back inducted in the airborne forces. So paratroopers, marines, naval infantry, in some places, um, the Chechen fighters who are heavily involved now in the fighting in um, um, near Bakhmut, especially around Klashevka and those sort of places, the Wagner organization, which, by the way, looks like it's coming back into the conflict area. The new head of the Wagner organization has just had a meeting with Putin, in which Putin basically invited them to come back, and they are apparently starting to do so. Um, but, of course, the Wagner organization did a lot of the heavy lifting around Bakhmut um, at the start of the year, and it was they who eventually captured both Solidar and Bakhmut. These are not part of the regular Russian military. And, of course, the Donbass militia, which has been doing much of the fighting still in places like Marinka and other such places. So it's this complex assortment of um, militias, elite troops from the airborne and naval infantry, um, Chechen fighters, um, other troops from various other um, contract organizations, a bit like Wagner, of which there are several on the battlefronts. It's they who have been doing much of the fighting in this control zone um, beyond the Surovikin line. And in doing so, they have been, of course, heavily supported by the Russian Air Force, which has been much more active this year. It's now engaging much more heavily in tactical combat. The numbers of um, precision-guided bombs appear to be increasing all the time, even exponentially. The numbers of drones are also increasing, and this is becoming a major complaint from the Ukrainians. The sky is now filled with Russian drones, some of them carrying out surveillance, some of them kamikaze drones able to carry out attacks, sometimes far beyond the, far behind the front lines. This includes the modified, the advanced um, new versions of the Lancet kamikaze drone. They are increasing in number continuously. So these forces, this interesting medley of forces that the Russians have been used, using not, um, beyond the Surovikin line, they're much more heavily supported than they were during the fighting in 2022, even though then, as now, they carried out the bulk of the fighting. And, of course, regular infantry have been involved. There's a regular infantry unit, for example, that for a long time defended Rabotino. It's now apparently been pulled back for rest and re-equipping. It's regular infantry who have been advancing towards Kupiansk. But, as I said, the bulk of the divisions, the tank forces, have been held back. Now, what this medley of units that have been doing in the zone of destruction is precisely that. They have been 
working to destroy the Ukrainian forces as they've attempted to attack and push through towards the Surovikin line. The Surovikin line has been a lure and a trap as well as a defence line. And of course, all of those obstacles, the minefields, the anti-tank ditches, the dragon's teeth, all of that, have also helped to work both as part of this strategy of destruction towards the Ukrainian forces, and also they provided a backstop so that the forces that have been fighting the Ukrainians in the zone of destruction, they've had the confidence that they've got large numbers of troops at their back who could be called on in a crisis, and they've also got heavy fortified lines that they can retreat to if they must. So what has happened is that Ukraine has been fighting only a part of the Russian army, perhaps in some ways the elite part of the Russian army, but not the heavy infantry or the tanks. And these forces have been tasked primarily and obviously not with capturing ground, but with carrying through this process of destruction. In the meantime, the heavy infantry and the tanks are being built up. We saw that the assault brigades are also being prepared and some big offensive will happen. Now, it could be that, as I said, this autumn, it's late this autumn or winter, we will see the Russians push, try to create these cauldrons, these mini cauldrons. Perhaps they wouldn't be so little. Um, on the east bank of the Oskol River, perhaps in the Orekhov area, where the Ukrainians have sort of semi-created a cauldron for themselves. Perhaps the advance, the capture by the Russians of Orekhovo Vasilyevka also suggests some sort of eventual Russian push in that direction. But I'm increasingly coming round to the view that with attrition working so well for the Russians, the big blow is being held back and it is more likely now to come in 2024. Perhaps even mid-year in 2024, when the 400,000 troops that are being called up now have been fully trained and when the Russian munitions factories have ensured not just that the army that is being built up now is fully equipped, but that it also has enough machines and vehicles and tanks and spare parts and shells in reserve to make a big offensive sustainable. And of course, by that point, the expectation is that the Ukrainians will be even more heavily attritioned, even more weakened than they are at present. So that is the kind of war, it seems to me, the strategy that the Russians at the moment, or so it seems to me, are fighting. But that they do eventually intend to deal... Ukraine a knockout blow. I think that has now become clear from the various statements that these Russian officials have made one after the other in quick succession over the course of this week. The two interviews given by Lavrov, of which the bigger one with TASS I discussed yesterday, the comments by Volodin that Ukraine's choice is between capitulation and the end of itself as a state. Shoigu's comment that Ukraine is on the path of self-destruction. 
These are warnings to the Ukrainian leadership, obviously, but they're also statements of intention, statements that are intended to be conveyed to the troops and to the command. And as I have said previously in previous videos, they clearly are coordinated with each other and must reflect a top-level political decision that must have been made in Moscow at some point over the last few weeks. So that, I think, is the Russian strategy. Now, Alaudinov, in one of his earlier commentaries, said that he thought the war would probably end around August of 2024. Maybe he's right. Maybe it is in the summer of 2024 that the big blow will come. But that it come, that it will come, of that I am now sure, it seems to me that these Russian commentaries all but confirm this. So, that's where we are. I have a sense in discussing all of this that I'm looking at a situation which now cannot be cannot be shifted. Um, as Jeff Roberts says, now is the last opportunity for Ukraine to come to some kind of compromise peace. The time to do that is being lost. There's no real discussion or thought about it in the West. The ceasefire freeze idea is manifestly ridiculous. Lavrov's interview yesterday should have made should have put that beyond any question of doubt, any any doubt. He said, why would the Russians simply sit back and allow the West to rearm Ukraine behind the shelter of a ceasefire. They're not going to do that. So all this talk about ceasefires, freezing the conflict, all those sort of things, it's, as I said, delusional idea. There's no talk of any more substantial plans Admiral Radikin comes up with his ideas about, you know, sustainable economics makes it sustainable without perhaps himself understanding the full implications of what he means, which is that Ukraine is going to lose the war. And there is no plan. There is no plan B. There is no real idea of where all this is going. I think that Larry Johnson's comments from about two weeks ago, that the American leadership in particular has not inter internalized the possibility about which they're now being increasingly warned by people like Daniel Davis, amongst others, that there is a real prospect of an Afghan-style Ukrainian collapse. I think that the leaders of the West are simply not able to absorb that they still want to believe that there is a ceasefire, that, sorry, that there is a stalemate, especially since they cannot grasp the reality that this offensive, this Ukrainian offensive, has not only failed, but it has been a strategic defeat. Those words I have never seen expressed anywhere. So, that's the reality that we face now. This week, to my mind, has now made that absolutely clear. Well, I'm going to now touch on briefly, fairly briefly, a few other issues. It seems to me, and this isn't uh, something I've talked about very much recently, but I might as well turn, turn to it now. It seems to me that um, the... Situation in the Western economies is becoming increasingly shakier, even as the Russian economy grows stronger. I was 
fascinated to see an article today by Ambrose Evans Pritchard in the Daily Telegraph. He spends his time writing flesh-creeping stories about the Russian and Chinese economies being on the verge of total collapse, which never seem to come true in the way that he expects. But that doesn't change the fact that he's also a clever man, and he's pointing out that with the return of inflation, which, by the way, he still denies, but that's the underlying cause, with interest rates remaining now very high in the West, as inflation has returned, and likely to remain higher, with the United States set on deficit financing into the indefinite future. We're now looking at a festering, growing crisis in the bond markets, of which, by the way, I suspect that there's earlier problems in the banking system that we saw in the United States a few months ago might very well have been a precursor. And he has written a rather disturbing article in The Telegraph about this, and I know that there are more and more people um, in the financial communities worrying about this, that there's a crisis in the bond markets, that there's severe problems now starting to hit the Eurozone. Italy's running an ever bigger deficit as the Maloney government begins to become increasingly unstuck, or so it seems to me. Um, and, of course, Germany's got its own problems. Things there altogether are not looking good in the bond markets, in the Western economies. And I noticed that Ambrose Evans Pritchard is both recommending and predicting before long a return to QE. And on that, he might, of course be proved entirely right. He also made the very interesting admission that one of the reasons for the problems in the bond markets and one of the reasons why there is a growing reluctance around the world to buy US treasuries is because of the way in which countries around the world, investors around the world, have seen have seen how the United States weaponizes its financial system and they want to keep a careful distance from it. And in fact, they want to pull out from it as fast as they can. About that, again, I'm sure that Ambrose is right. He's not said it much up to now. It's an interesting admission. It's what one that um, I suspect he wants to um, address very deeply. It was squirreled away in his article in the Telegraph. I suspect we'll be hearing more about this fairly soon. And if there really is a major crisis in the bond markets, if all sorts of problems start to move from the bond markets into the wider financial system, which I can't see how they cannot do, and if all that, in turn, starts to affect the wider Western economy, then, of course, bailouts this time might be a lot more difficult, with, deficit, with deficits already high and with debt levels extremely high. I can actually see how there might, at that point, be a need to look for outside help from those countries with the deep pockets, China, other countries in the global south. And if that indeed does happen, then of course these countries are going to back that with demands for changes in US policies which the US and the Western powers and the Europeans might not be happy about at all. But anyway, that is some way off.
In the meantime, another topic which I have not covered for a long time is the accelerating collapse, or so it seems to me, of French influence in West Africa. And I want to stress French influence. I don't by that mean that France is being driven out of West Africa or that Western African states want to sever their relationship with France. But this informal empire that France was running in West Africa has now clearly suffered a major blow because I think it's now become clear that ECOWAS has no intention of intervening in Niger. If there was such a plan, if there was such an intention, it seems to have been dropped. That has left France severely exposed. They've now been forced to pull out their ambassador from Niger. They're apparently going to pull out more of their um, people from Niger. Their bases are going to be pulled out of Niger. France has suffered a spectacular defeat in Niger. And though I understand that the new authorities in Niger are still anxious to maintain a good relationship with the United States, um, it does seem as if um, they will probably, over time, start to reorient their policies more with those of China and Russia. And elsewhere in Africa, on the African continent, I noticed that Libya, or at least the various factions in Libya, seem to be increasingly also um, working with the Eurasian states. Um, there's been a Russian delegation to Af to lead to Libya. Um, Gen uh, Marshal, I believe he's called Marshal Haftar, one of the Libyan um, faction leaders, has recently come to Moscow, where apparently he's had talks with the Russian military leadership, including with uh, the Russian defense minister, so the rumor goes, uh, um, Shoigu. Uh, the, so Russian influence in Libya seems to be increasing once more. And the Russians, for their part, as their economy grows in size, but as they face labor shortages and inflation issues, seem to be looking for ways to try to resolve these issues by establishing factor, either drawing in um, guest workers from various places or establishing um, factories relocating production where labor is available and cheaper. And um, there's been suggestions that the that VAS, the company that makes the Lada cars, still very popular in Russia, by the way, um, they apparently intend to build two factories, or at least have been talking about building two factories in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And interestingly, they're also now talking about setting up a car factory to build larger cars in Ethiopia as well. So, interesting way of creating a new um, industrial system. But one can see that all of these things are being integrated with each other, that all of these various Parts of the industrial chain, the global chains, are being created. And of course, all of this under the overall umbrella of the BRICS. Ethiopia, of course, is part of the BRICS. Um, the Central Asian states are parts of the Eurasian Economic Union. Belarus, another part of the Eurasian Economic Union, is now also becoming involved in Russian civil and military aircraft projects. There's an awful lot going on on that side, even as the West, as I said, seems to be facing increasingly complicated and intractable economic problems, economic and social problems. And 
Alex and I, Alex Mr. Four and I, we just have just finished doing a live stream, which you can find on the Duran. You can find it on all our platforms, including Rumble, by the way. But you can go and see what we said there. And I mentioned, without perhaps realizing it, that Elon Musk apparently has said the same thing. But this is having something of an end of empire moment in the sense that all of these problems are piling up in the economy, um, in the West, the growing problems within Western societies, that there's these pressures on the borders, on the, on the sort of frontiers, if you like. There's the Russians pushing hard in Ukraine, perhaps preparing for a big offensive there with all of the geopolitical consequences that I've talked about many times. All of these things happening. And at the same time, at the center of power, which continues to be Washington, people increasingly are immersed in what I have to say, from the outside, looks like factional fighting. All of these lawfare battles that are now taking place involving Donald Trump, uh, the problems of the president himself with impeachment and all that. It's as if, even as the situation deteriorates, the elite at the centre are turning on themselves and are increasingly expending their energy on fighting each other. And that most certainly is an established pattern when empires and dynasties fall. Well, we'll see whether it continues that way or whether there is a resurgence. In the United States, the latter is certainly possible. And in some ways, I would certainly personally want to see it that way. But anyway, that is the point where I'm going to finish this program today. We've had less news today, but it's a good moment, I think, to take stock and to pause an offensive in Ukraine that has failed, deteriorating economic conditions in the West, the Russians carefully preparing their, ne their next moves, and what I suspect will be their big move next year. And in the West, we have no real plan, no real idea what to do. And in Washington itself, factional fighting seems to be mostly what the elites are engaging in instead. Well, that's my programme for today. More from me soon. May I say again, um, thank you for joining me. And can I also remind you that you can find all of our programmes on our various platforms, especially Locals, uh, Rumble uh, and X, the former Twitter. And um, you can also um, support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget you can go to our shop and buy the things that we have there, our magic mugs, our uh, hats, our t-shirts, all those things. And last but not least, if you have liked this video, please remember to take the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.